Great. Amazing. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome one of probably the one of the most interesting human beings on the face of the earth. His work especially is quite fascinating. I think you guys are going to enjoy a lot of the stories that he has no doubt got in his repertoire. His name is AJ Jacobs. Now, for those of you that somehow don't know who he is or his, his writing or his work, he is an author, he's a journalist, lecturer, and he's a human guinea pig. Some of the things this guy puts himself through is quite interesting. You'll get to hear more about it soon. He has written, I believe, several New York Times bestselling books that combine memoirs, science, humor, and a dash of self-help, as he says. Uh, his first book is called The Know-It-All, One Man's Humble Quest to Become the Smartest Person in the World. AJ, man, did you end up becoming the smartest person in the world? <laughs> I don't think I did. I don't think I did. But I got a tiny bit smarter, and I learned a lot. I might have, might have forgotten 99.5% of what I've learned, but still I got that 0.5%, and that's something. It's about the quest to become the smartest person in the world. It doesn't the mean he quest did. Is the, yes, the quest. That's right. The what journey you did, is everything. You, what you did, I found really, really interesting. You read the entire, en, entire encyclopedia, Britannica, in a quest to learn everything in the world, which I, I just, yeah, boggles my mind. And then get this. You you wrote another book. You lived uh, a, the year of living biblically, one man's humble quest to follow the Bible literally as possible. Now, I'm a Christian, and I can probably say that 99.9% .9 of the time I try my best to live like what the Bible says, but I, I fail miserably. So how you were able to do it in a year that's just well, I failed me. miserably every day as well. Of course. Yeah, you can't live up to, you know, the, no coveting, no gossiping, no lying. I live in New York City. That's sort of, you know, 80 percent of my job, my uh, my life. So, yeah, but it was it was all about the effort, all about the the uh, the journey, as we say. Which I think speaks to a very good aspect of all your writings is fundamentally the journey the effort and of actually trying something and and learning along along the journey of life so aj man can i welcome you so much to the story box podcast today thank you for having me delighted to be here i've got to keep that long introduction in the actual uh, audio version <laughs> so people can actually understand what i'm talking about pr properly Perfect. um i know it's a little bit longer than what i'd normally do but you've got a huge repertoire of, I only read out two books. You've written so many others. Uh, you've got a new one out that, that came out this year, I believe, and you're working on another one, The Puzzler. You're trying to learn all about puzzles and, and why it interests people about that. Um, but yeah, so much, so many topics to cover in, in just an hour's time, AJ, honestly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where do we don't have to start? cover them all. Where to start? That is the 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 important question. But I guess I'm going to start with the question that I start all my conversations with, which is, what does success look like for you? Yeah, and since I I listened to the show, I knew this was coming, uh, and so I should have a, a stellar answer. But it's such a an interesting and hard question. I don't think I have the one perfect answer. Um, one answer I thought of is. Success means uh, when you are able to make your life better at the same time as making other people's lives better. So, you, you know, you can make your life better at the expense of other people. But to me, success is when you are doing that. Another thought I had is I think a lot of life is is less like an on off switch and more like a dimmer. Right. Uh, so. Uh, I think success is the same way. It's not like one day you wake up and you're like, I'm successful. Yesterday I wasn't. It's like, you know, some days you're more successful than others. Um, some days you're happier than others. And someday, sometimes it's a mix. So I was just thinking of an example of, of how one experience can have elements of failure and success at the same time. And one example uh that's just recent is I've been negotiating uh, 
for this podcast. I'm going to do a podcast and we've been in mm-hmm. negotiations for months and it's driving me crazy. So in one sense, like that's a that's a big downside. That's like a real annoyance um, in my life. On the other hand, uh, I it gave me time to write this article that I wrote for The Guardian about the Constitution and living by the, the strictest interpretation of the Constitution. And my book editor loved that article so much that that's now my next book. And I wouldn't have had time to do that if the negotiations for the podcast had happened. Uh, so in a sense, you know, it turned out to be a positive that these negotiations are dragging on for months. So it's very hard to say X is, is a total success and Y is a total failure. It's always a mix. I believe it or not, I was actually going to start off this conversation with a different question, but I thought I'd, I'd start there and I'm glad that I did because I'm curious, having said all that, I mean, you you mentioned that one thing led to something you didn't really expect it to in a roundabout way. Has that sort of been the theme of, of your life where you've gone to do something and something else has come out of it? Well, absolutely. For instance, the uh, you mentioned my book, The Year of Living Biblically, where I tried to follow all the rules of the Bible. Um, and just to give some quick background on that until before we get to the answer. Um, I, I grew up in a very secular home and I, uh, I had no religion. As I say in the book, I'm Jewish, but I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. I don't know <laughs> if that translates to Australia, but, uh, but the point was, uh, I had a son. I wanted to know what to teach him, if anything, about my heritage. So I thought one way to learn about the Bible would be to live it, to actually walk in the four in the steps of uh, our forefathers. So I uh, I wanted to follow every rule I could find in the Bible. And that turned out to be a lot of rules because they're the famous ones, which I wanted to follow, the Ten Commandments and love your neighbor. But then there are all these ones, especially in the Old Testament, uh, that uh, that are don't get a lot of play. And the Bible in Leviticus says you shouldn't shave the corners of your beard. I didn't know where the corners were. So I just let the whole thing grow. And I looked nuts. I looked like, you know, uh, Ted Kaczynski, the unit bomber. Uh, and, uh, and I spent a lot of time at airport security. So, um, but anyway, there were many. So, I, you know, I, after I shaved the beard and, uh, uh, but there were many parts of this experiment that I have kept with me. And one of them was the idea of gratitude because gratitude is, saying prayers of thanksgiving is a big part of the Bible. Uh, and I wanted to continue that. Uh, and so to answer your question, I was continuing that by, I, I had a ritual at dinner where I would try to thank the people who helped make the dinner possible. So I would say, you know, let's thank the farmer who grew these tomatoes for our tomato sauce and, and the woman who sold me the pasta at the store. And my son, who is 10 or 11, said, you know, that's fine, but those people are not in our apartment. They can't hear you. So if you really were committed to gratitude, you would thank them in person. And I sort of saw that as that's a lovely idea, a challenge, like almost like a challenge. I was like, all right, I'm going to try that. So that was my next book was about going around and trying to thank a thousand people who had even the smallest role in my morning cup of coffee. So the farmer and the the barista, but also the the logo designer and the truck driver and the the biologist who came up with that strain of coffee and on and on and on. So yes, it was uh, the Bible led to another project. And it often happens that something will will just lead. And, um, you know, I think it is a balance. It's nice to have like a long-term plan, but it's also you have to react to the circumstances. And when inspiration strikes, you've got to follow that as well. Did you ever imagine yourself doing any of these things when you're growing up? Was this something that you wanted to pursue? I definitely did not imagine this. I, I always loved books and I always had a very high level of curiosity. Curiosity and gratitude are two of my favorite human drives. 
I so I was it. never the you know the most athletic, uh, not even the smartest, but uh, uh, certainly not the best looking. But but I might have had the highest curiosity level of uh, anyone in my in my high school class. So. And that was even back then. I, I remember we lived a block away from the Scientology Center in New York. And I remember nice. going in there as a high schooler just to see what it was like. I never joined Scientology. And um, and I actually gave them a fake name because I was kind of I knew enough that I didn't want them following me around the rest <laughs> of my life. So uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that level of curiosity is is, and actually, one of my favorite quotes, I used to work at Esquire magazine, and I interviewed Alex Trebek, the late, great Jeopardy host. And he had a quote that I think about a lot. He said, I'm curious about everything, even those things that don't interest me, yeah. which is kind of paradoxical, but I totally get it. I'm interested in even the most boring things like, I don't know, concrete or or accounting is stereotypically boring. But if you scratch beneath the surface, I'm sure accounting is fascinating. I should actually scratch and I shouldn't check in on that because maybe it is just boring. But I don't think so. I think it's going to have all these levels of, uh, you know, cause it's about people's jobs, which is about their passions. And it's about people, not about numbers, just not about abstract numbers. It's about numbers that represent people and their lives. Growing up, I can relate to the aspect of being quite curious. I was very much uh, an introverted individual that loved asking a bunch of weird, wild and outrageous questions to people half the time, like <laughs> why do people believe in Santa Claus or even the Easter Bunny, for example? I, I just couldn't understand why that was the case because I didn't believe it. <laughs> like it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Sorry for people that are listening to this and you do believe it still <laughs> as adults. Uh, but also I, I remember as a young kid, so you know how you walked into Scientology and, and, and things like that. I, I ended up, so we used to live on a cul-de-sac and we were told that there used to be like this kidnapper that lived at the top, top of the street. And so as a, I think a five, four, five year old kid, I hop on my bike and I decide to ride up to see whether or not it was true. So I remember oh going back to the house. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> Knocked on the door and an old lady answered the door. And I remember just asking her, excuse me, old lady, does a, a kidnapper live here? And she had, the, <laughs> had the, the wise intuition to send me home. And I remember going home and telling my mum, and I got in the biggest trouble <laughs> <laughs> that for, that, for that aspect. Yes. So she did she answer? Or do we know? Or she did or she say, no comment, get a what get out of my house. She basically just told me to go home. She thought that so I was a, a young a kid that didn't know. I'm still suspicious. I'm, I'm suspicious I'm still, it was her. That's one of the biggest questions I've still got, believe it or not, <laughs> <laughs> as an adult. <laughs> like, is it true or not? Or is it just superstition? Or were we told, you know, like, don't talk to strangers. But for me, right. I would talk to a lot of people. So I had to be sort of weaned out of that quite... <laughs> <laughs> sort of well, I will. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, certainly anything. There, too much curiosity can be dangerous. But I have, I do think I've had, uh, I've read two books actually on the uh, on the joys of talking to strangers, and that that was one of the things that we've really lost in this society when we're in our little bubbles. And we're not, uh, I mean, we're screaming at them on Twitter, but we're not talking to them face to face at a, like, you know, at a bar or whatever. So, uh, so yes, I am all for talking to strangers. Well, it's if they don't so kidnap easy. You. Sorry, you go. I said, as long as they don't kidnap you. Like, <laughs> to you. See, that's a crucial point. Or they don't attack you or do anything like that in person, right. as long as it's perfectly safe. But I think a lot of people these days, they hide behind the wall of social media and they just go out all out. Like for me, Twitter is just kind of like cesspool of vehement, vile hate. And I rarely go on there. It's just same, same with Instagram sometimes, but Twitter's for whatever reason, it's a lot worse. So I try and get off there, but you mentioned something interesting that I wanted to ask you about. Why do you think people are sort of losing this ability to be curious in society? 
Well, I think that sometimes curiosity can be a little bit uncomfortable because you are challenging your own conceptions and it sometimes feels better. I just saw a tweet that said, um, I just read a great article that confirmed everything I know. Uh, and it was a joke, but like that is a lot of what we do. Like we just th read things that confirm our point of view and you're like, see, I was right. And that does feel better in the short term, maybe. But I think it's unhealthy in the long term. So sometimes curiosity can be uncomfortable, but I, I do think it's it's absolutely worth it. So how do we get back to a place of helping people become more curious and, and not be afraid per se to ask people questions, even if it may be somewhat fearful? Well, that, it's interesting because you mentioned briefly my, my most recent book is called The Puzzler. Yeah. And it's about my love of puzzles of all kinds, crosswords, jigsaws, uh, mazes. And um, but it goes beyond that. It's, I think, a worldview. Uh, the music, I quote the musician Quincy Jones, who says his philosophy is, I don't have problems. I have puzzles. So mm -hmm. he fra reframes the problems in his life as puzzles. And I think that is a very powerful way to look at the world because problems are very, they're negative, they're annoying, they're um, intimidating. Whereas puzzles, they're solution oriented. Sometimes they can be playful and fun. So trying to see life's struggles as a puzzle, how can we solve this? And this relates directly to your question because Say I'm talking to someone on the other side of the political spectrum. So, you know, I'm sort of, I, I, I'm mostly liberal. I have, you know, I differ and uh, we all have our, hopefully we all have our own point of view that's not strictly one or the other. But I would say I, I tend more towards the liberal side. So if I'm talking to someone who's like an ardent Trump supporter, instead of trying to battle them with words and facts and say, you know, look at this evidence. What are you, an idiot? That does not work. That, and it often is counterproductive. It just polarizes people. So instead, I will go into a conversation like that, seeing it as a puzzle, almost a cooperative mystery. What, what do we really disagree on? And why do we do, well, is there evidence that I can present or she can present to me that would change one of our minds? And if not, what what can we do? Where can we go from there? So all of those are fun mysteries and to treat it like that as a puzzle as opposed to a war, it is so much more productive in getting people to shift their point of view. And it's also just, I think, you know, other, if I went into every conversation as a war, I would be dead of a heart attack by now because it is so stressful, like the world we live in. So, yeah, this is this is one of the real profound changes I've done since writing that book about puzzlers, seeing more of life as a puzzle. I like that concept of seeing life as a puzzle. And, and for me, especially being able to have people on that I may not necessarily agree with. I don't feel like it is my place at all to attack them and say, you're wrong. I'm right. And here's why I'm right. And here's why you're wrong and vice versa. I think it's always good to come alongside a person, see it as this sort of puzzle in a way and trying to work out, okay, how can we be kind to one another during this conversation what kind of questions should we be asking ourselves here to sort of, sort of uh, get to a common common place as yeah. as it were? And I think yes, your podcast is an excellent example of of curiosity in action. I think it all comes down to understanding that we're all human beings. What that looks like is that we all have a story, and we shouldn't go attacking another human being. Because really, you're attacking their story. You're attacking their belief systems. You're attacking their character, all these things, which doesn't, doesn't bode well if you look at history. If you can learn anything from history, you don't go on the offensive. You sort of stay back and, and lean in gently 
as it were. Yeah. And it is, I do try to go out of my way to find something good, even in those things that I strongly disagree with. So I'll give you an example. Like the, um, well, the year of living biblically, I spent a lot of time talking to people of different religious backgrounds who were taking the Bible literally in one way or the other. So I went to the, um, the Creation Museum oh, yeah. and uh, where they, uh, you know, it's like a museum, a science museum devoted to the idea that the earth was made 5,000 years ago. Now, I super strongly disagree with that. I am a big fan of evolution. But uh, I think, you know, it, the easiest way would be just to make fun of them, shooting, but that's shooting fish in a barrel. It's just, uh, so I did try to see the world from their point of view. And, and I did find a couple of elements that I think are lovely. And, and one of them is, if you believe the world is just 5,000 years old, then we, and we all came from Adam and Eve, then that is, we are really closely related. That's just a few generations that we all go back. So it means that we're all really quite close cousins. And this idea of a global family, um, they really, they really buy into that. And, um, and I love that. So, uh, I think, uh, I see the advantage of that. I, I, I'd rather look at it more metaphorically than that, it, you know, it's not 5,000 years. But but even so, we're all still cousins because we all came from the same uh, little uh, strain, DNA strand that appeared in an underwater volcano millions of years ago. But we are. We are still cousins. So I find it an interesting challenge to, to look for the good in uh, even in those I disagree with strongly. How did you go with loving thy neighbor or loving those that you do disagree with or you may not appreciate as much? <laughs> yeah, no, well, that is tough. I mean, well, there's two different things. First of all, loving your neighbor was interesting because I live in New York City and, <laughs> and, um, it, we're not, we don't even, I, I see my neighbors in the hall and I nod at them. I don't, I barely know them. I, I barely know their names. So I made during that year a real concerted effort to get to know my neighbors. And I was able to befriend one of them who was fascinating. And she was uh, Jimmy, friends with Jimi Hendrix in the 60s. Oh. She was a hippie. So that was great. Um, yeah, loving your enemy. That is a tough one. Uh I mean, it is, I think it's, it's got great elements. I guess it, it also is related to the idea of forgiveness, which is one of my favorite ideas in the New Testament, this idea of forgiveness, because forgiveness is really a wonderful and under, especially now, gee, we need, we need more forgiveness now. Um, because it's not just good for the person you're forgiving. It is so good for you. Like the amount of, hatred that leaves your heart when you truly forgive is it's so liberating and uh you don't realize how much energy you have put into sort of holding a grudge against someone yeah. so uh yeah but it's a challenge i mean i don't know i'm trying to think of any suggestions i have on how to forgive people you hate you have any suggestions what are well, your strategies for forgiving people well for me like it's not easy, as you said, and I'm still learning as best I possibly can, like as a 26-year-old, and I don't believe that I'll ever be this true example of, all right, Jay's forgiven this person, so therefore that's it. Like, you know, I should look up to him. But I I looked at, I interviewed uh, a lady. She's, I believe, 95 or 96 now, current to follow with it but um she's a holocaust survivor mm. and she wrote a book called the gift and in it and really she talks about this as well but she got to the place where she could forgive and i mean when you get to that place of all right the worst thing in human history one of the worst things i should say the holocaust when you when you can forgive that event and what they did to her to her that is a special place to get to. And that is someone I would look up to in my own life to say, well, if she can do it, 
then what's to say that I can't do it in my life with some of the things and some of the people that have hurt me and my enemies and so to speak. So for as much as I possibly can, AJ, and I'm not, not the best at this, but if someone, if I don't agree with someone or if I try not to have any enemies, I try to have more friends than enemies. And if I disagree with someone, that's okay. I'm allowed to disagree with you. doesn't mean I have to disassociate myself or not be a friend. I, I think that is the wrong way to look at it, to, to be honest. So yeah, that's my that guess. Yeah, no, those are great. And yes, the I, I want to listen to that episode with that woman who forgave the people who put her through the Holocaust. That is a remarkable, evolved spirit right there. Very impressed. She is, she is a extremely wise woman. Now, on the other hand, there is another lady that I spoke to who also went through a Holocaust and she she can't forgive for the ones that aren't able to. So there's that kind of perspective too, you know. Yeah. Which I you know I'm not, I can't criticize that like that. I'm certainly totally understandable and human. Yeah, I I completely agree with you on on that front. But what was the hardest rule for you to follow with the the commands or the rules? Well, there were two different types of heart. So there was there was the hard um, avoiding the small sins of life that we, you know, I mentioned the lying and the coveting and the gossiping. Then there were the rules that, especially in the Old Testament, that that are sometimes don't uh, quite align with modern day laws and customs. So the Hebrew scriptures that say you should stone adulterers, they say it many times. So I figured I should try to stone an, at least one. And I was able to. So I'll tell you quickly how that happened. I was I was really getting into it because I feel a lot of times the outer affects the inner. So I was even dressing the part. I had the beard. I had a robe, white robe and sandals I'd wear sometimes around New York City where I live. And I went to Central Park and this guy came up to me and he said, what's going on? Why are you dressed like that? And I explained I'm trying to follow everything in the Bible from the Ten Commandments to stoning adulterers. And he says, well, I'm an adulterer. Are you going to stone me? And I said, well, that would be wonderful. (laughs) That is a lovely offer. Thank you. And I took out a handful of stones that I had been carrying around for weeks, hoping to run into an adulterer or a self-professed adulterer, at least. And I showed them to him and they were very small stones because like pebbles, I didn't want to go to jail. I didn't want to kill him. So he was very aggressive. He did not see this as uh, something he wanted to participate. So he grabbed the stones out of my hand and threw them at my face. And I thought, an eye for an eye, also in the Bible. I This gave me the opportunity to throw one back at him. So that's how I checked that off the list. Um, but it was hard. And, and I will tell you, there was also stone in the Hebrew scriptures. You also have to stone Sabbath breakers. You have to stone um, astrologers. I did stone an astrologer who did not appreciate it. I thought I didn't even think she noticed. I was just walking by this woman who had like a sidewalk astrology thing. And I just dropped a stone on her shoe and thinking she wouldn't even notice. And she like said, what, what, what are you doing? What happened? And I said, Oh, I'm, I, I explained because I had to tell the truth. And she was pissed. She did not think it was funny. <laughs> she was like yelling at me, screaming, cursing. So, yeah, it wasn't always easy. Far out. <laughs> 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 what, what sort of possessed you to do this for a year? Well, um, I mean, part of it was this idea that... Um, I guess there were there were several motivations. One was this idea that I grew up with no religion and and I just I figured I thought religion would sort of fade away and that we would all embrace sort of a you know a rational scientific point of view. Uh that obviously didn't happen. So I said, you know, what am I missing something? What's going on? What 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 in religion is is this like uh, you know, like I, I, I've never heard Beethoven. So am I missing a huge part of life? Uh, 
And so that was sort of one of the big motivations to try to see, am I missing anything? Um, uh, and there are elements of religion that I loved, like the community, the rituals. I'm still not a believer in God, but I think religion is much more than belief in God. It's, you know, it's, it's many things. Um, so I did like that. Um, and then, you know, I also wanted to know what to teach my kids about religion and, and whether to continue the traditions that uh, I had inherited. And I do, I do like many of the traditions, um, like, you know, the, the Seder, which is sort of like, you know, uh, a second Thanksgiving, uh, just the whole family gets together and, and it, I love, you know, I love an excuse to get the family together. So, so that, I guess, uh, those were the main motivations of why I embarked on this project. Yeah. Oh, and I had a book contract. <laughs> I also <laughs> wanted to write a book and I knew it would be an interesting topic. I also, as we said, I love, I'm super curious. So I loved learning. It was one of my favorite years, just l- I mean, I spent more than I spent like two years because I did a deep dive just talking to reading everything I could. I had a a board of spiritual advisors, rabbis and ministers and priests and scholars and atheists. And I just loved. In fact, this one I'm I'm particularly proud of. Uh, I think I might be one of the only people to out Bible talk a Jehovah's Witness. Because he came over to my, I invited him over. They don't really ring your doorbell in New York. So I had to call up and request him, which they were already like, didn't know what to do with. And then he came over and I just peppered him with so many questions that after three and a half hours, he looked at his watch and he's like, I got to go. I can't handle (laughs) you. But I was fascinated. I'm just fascinated by people's beliefs and customs and culture. So, um, so yeah, I was very proud to have that on on my, uh, that, that achievement. Did the Jehovah's Witness give you any substantial answers to your questions? Oh, yeah. Well, it depends how you define substantial. I mean, he certainly, he did answer my questions. I, you know, I got, I got a sense of his belief. it was not does not align with my belief, but um, uh, but it was fascinating, and uh, you know it it was good to bust stereotypes and you know realize that you know no one is no one is out there try well very few few people think that they're out there trying to scam or do evil. I really believe most people are genuine in their thoughts that this is. This is going to make the world better. This is the right way. And um, so even though I don't agree with him, I loved learning his point of view. Yeah. I think it's it's good to have an open mind with different point of views and different – that's what I've learned, I guess, the most with the show is that, yes, I have my own belief system, but I also know that I don't know everything – and it goes back to what we were saying earlier, that sense of curiosity is if someone knows something that I may not know or they've got a different perspective on it, I'm open to hearing about it. It may yeah. not necessarily change my belief system, but I'm open to hearing it. And you may be able to convince me of something that I wasn't aware of before. And that is all good oh. for me. Yeah, I think changing your mind some people, it's often seen as a negative. It's like, oh, you're a flip flopper, oh, you, you know. But no, it's it's something. If you change your mind because of evidence, that is a strength. That's the basis of science. Um, and on this topic, there is actually a quote I like, which is uh, that you should keep an open mind, not so open that your brain falls out, but keep <laughs> an open mind. So you you have to balance a little bit of. Uh, well, Carl Sagan has a great quote that I'm going to butcher, but basically it says something along the lines of you've got to balance the, the deepest curiosity and open mindedness with also the strongest skepticism for um, making sure that these ideas meet a level of evidence that um, that makes them true. So you got to balance the, the deep curiosity with also 
keeping a, a little skepticism so you don't fall for, you know, crazy conspiracy theories that are not true. Yeah, that is the the fine line, I think, the, the relationship between truth versus conspiracy. <laughs> exactly. And there are some conspiracies that are true. People do conspire. But, I mean, I talk about this in, in several of my books, how I mean, we are drawn, our brains are drawn to conspiracies because they are great stories. And they are, you know, they had evolutionarily, it was advantageous to come up with a story. If you hear a rustle in the grass and you're a cave person, you've probably heard this, you know, it's it's better to assume that it's a snake than it's the wind. Because if you're wrong uh, with with uh, the snake, you're in trouble. And it is a snake. That's that's trouble. You're dead. But if you're wrong with the wind, then it's just like no big deal. Yeah. I think for me, having this this whole idea, because I know there's a ton of conspiracies out there, but it doesn't help when there's a lot of lies. And it's like you've got to try and gauge between whether or not this is just a lie versus a conspiracy lie versus a conspiracy that someone believes is true. It's a lot of work, man. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I'll tell you, I started on a book before my I st there have been a couple of projects where I, I put in three months work. I had a contract to write this book and it was all about this. How do we know what's true? It was called fact checking my life. <laughs> and I was going to fact check everything. How do I know the world is round? How do I know my wife loves me? She says she does, but I'm not in her mind. How do I know the New York Times is more reliable than Fox News? And uh and it was it was fascinating, but it was actually such a stressful experience that I called my agent and I said, I'm miserable. I am miserable. I don't know what's true. And it's just driving me crazy. And so I um, I said, I really just want to I love puzzles. Why, why don't I write a book about puzzles? And and the publisher was like, you know, that that's fine. So the publisher gave it the thumbs up and. And saved me. I still think it's an interesting idea that I want to get back to sometime, but I have to figure out the right approach. Yeah, when when you're less miserable when you're writing it, that's the <laughs> that's the key, I think. Because <laughs> it's nothing worse than writing something when you're downright miserable. Like I remember oh. the first the first draft of my book after I, I finished it, I'm like, what is this? Oh man! Well, I had no no idea what it was, and then came the misery. <laughs> oh, yeah. It wasn't so much well, miserable as I was writing it, but it was more after I finished the first draft. Then came the misery, and then suddenly, when I came back to it, I felt a little bit less miserable, but still Good. a bit miserable. <laughs> well, as long as it was less miserable, that's trending in the right direction. And did you find? In terms of feedback, was it editors, friends, yourself? How did you know what to change? Well, I finished the first draft and I couldn't make heads or tails of what it actually was. Uh, and then I sent it to a friend of mine who read it. And the look on, on that person's face was just a rather disbelief. They couldn't understand what was going on in the book anyway. And I was just like so ashamed of it. So I decided to shelve it. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to write a book ever again. Forget this. And then uh, it was me actually coming back to it uh, about a year or so, few, almost a year later when I had gotten the, the inspiration to write another book completely. So I got halfway through writing another book that I was more inspired to write when I realized that my grandfather's words of you start something, be excellent, give it your best, that I hadn't given it my best. So I shelved the the book that I was currently writing and then went back to the old one, deleted everything and started again. Wow, that is interesting. Yeah. Now, I will tell you, I, I think that is one of the greatest strategies is to if you're if you're uh, stuck, then step away. And that I talk about it a lot in my book on puzzles. And even Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest thinkers of all time, he wrote about it in his diaries. He said, if I'm painting and I'm stuck on a problem, then I walk away, I take a nap, I go for a walk. 
And then I come back and my mind is fresh and I'm able to solve the problem. So uh, I think you did a, a great thing there. Yeah, looking at a particular puzzle for a long time can kind of tire you out even more. And then once you get that that tiresome attitude, you become more miserable and you're like, oh, I stuff this. Right. I mean, it's worthless, right? But then when you take some time away from it and you come back to it, you start realizing things you didn't realize before. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you get stuck in a rut. You get in these these neural ruts where you just can't get out. And yeah, so you've got to you got to give your mind a break. You got to look, read something completely different and uh, it'll, it'll be stewing in the back of your brain. I mean, there are studies that talk about it sort of marinates in there. So your mind is working on it. Uh, but then you'll go back and then it'll click. Hopefully you might have to take eight or nine breaks. Who knows? (laughs) (laughs) Don't be afraid to take as many breaks as you, as you want. I wanted to ask you this question. I won't use the word problem because we've changed that word now to puzzle. (laughs) What has been the most intriguing puzzle that you've had to face in your life that you, I guess, wrestled with? I guess I would have to say it's my own demons. Uh, It is my my own negative thoughts. And so, um, and my, you know, I... I have been depressed uh, several times in my life. So that's the biggest puzzle. How do I, um, how do I try to have mental health? And I have, you know, I've come up with tons of strategies and it's all a matter of trying different strategies out and balancing the strategies. And, you know, one random one that comes to mind is I find talking to myself out loud is a really good strategy to battle uh, bad thinking. Because when, when I start to say it out loud, like if I start to say, oh, my life is over, I, you know, I missed this deadline, um, I've never, no one's ever going to hire me again, I hear myself say it and I'm like, that doesn't sound right. That sounds like, you know, crazy catastrophizing. So let's, you know, let's rein it in. And it's almost... Um, it's a way to sort of keep an eye on your brain and your thoughts and make them more um, more visible to yourself. Sort of, a, a, um, you're able to have metacognition, thinking about thinking. So, uh, so I have little post-it notes all over my room that say "talk to yourself, talk to." So I look, and so, sometimes I used to look much more crazy because before Bluetooth, like, you know, when you're talking to yourself on the street, people were like, you know, think you're uh, you've lost it. But but now you can just pretend that you're talking to your your AirPod. Uh, But usually I'm not. I'm just talking to myself. I love that. I love it because I do it in the car when I'm driving somewhere. Good. Yeah. It's so liberating in a sense as well. Like you, you mentioned things that when, when you get it from your brain and you actually speak it, it's like you're giving Liberty away in a sense, like you're, you're freeing yourself from that demon. Yeah. Get out of me. That's a good way to think about it. Uh, Right. That's the way I look at it, but I understand your your story in the sense of going through depression. So I've, I've been through that too, but and I've had to learn somewhat the hard way a lot of the time, like how to fix this, how to manage it. But I love what you mentioned earlier about coming back to gratitude. Like the whole idea of attitude is a gratitude being incredibly important. Did you find that now that you implement this attitude of gratitude that it overall, how, how does it affect your overall health? Oh, it's huge. I mean, it's still a struggle. It's still a practice. It's not something that I can just, you know, that automatically, I still have to do rituals. I still every morning email my mom, one thing I'm grateful for. And the more specific, the better. Uh, I still, um, you know, I still also, one of the big lessons of that and other books was the idea of 
uh, how much behavior affects your thoughts. So it's not just that your thoughts affect your behavior, but it's often the other way around. So the whole, whole idea of fake it till you feel it, the whole idea of um, there's a great quote. I wish I had come up with it, but I think it's the founder of Habitat for Humanity is credited with it. And he says, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. So that's all about love with the gratitude book. You know, I had to spend several hours a day just thanking random people. And I would wake up in, a, in my negative bias, default, cranky, Larry David mood. But I would force myself to thank people. And after you do it for enough, if you're calling enough people, and then it tricks your mind. And you're like, you know what? I am grateful. And uh, it's very powerful. I remember, I, and it always felt so good. I would call the woman who did pest control for the for the warehouse where the coffee was stored. And she would, I would say, I know this is crazy, but I just want to thank you for keeping the bugs out of my coffee. And she's like, well, thank you. I don't get a lot of credit. I know it is weird, but I, I never get acknowledged. So thank, thank you. And that made me feel better as this virtuous cycle. Uh, so yeah, faking it till you feel it is, um, is a huge one in gratitude, but also in confidence and, and compassion and anything, any, any of the good emotions. The two words you can never use or overuse is thank you. I love that. Yeah, no, people are definitely under thanked and, um, and it, it can be a little awkward, uh, I think, uh, like, you know, calling strangers, but, but. <laughs> 90 and 5% of them are skeptic. You know, 5% are like, is this a pyramid scheme? Like, what do you want from me? But 95%, uh, you'll get positive reactions. People really do like to be thanked because I, you know, I feel we all feel we are not acknowledged enough for what we do. People take us for granted. And in many senses, we do. You know, it's hard to, part of the lesson from that coffee book was, how many hundreds of people it took to create a cup of coffee. And these are people I totally took for granted. You know, people, there are all these steps that I had no idea that, you know, they had to put the coffee, coffee comes in these little fruits, like little, they call them coffee cherries. And someone has to get the the fruit off of the bean and someone has to roast the bean and someone has to taste it. And, you know, there are hundreds of people. Uh, so just remembering that instead of focusing on the three or four things that go wrong, trying to focus on the hundreds that have gone right is a really powerful way to battle that feeling of, of depression and feeling of, you know, entitlement and all that. I think it was Theodore Roosevelt that said people don't, care how much you know until they know how much you care. I think, mm -hmm. I, got it, I think I got it right. I mean, it's one of my favorite quotes because it sort of reminds me of, well, I need to show people going back to what we were saying earlier, I need to show them love. I need to show them respect. I need to show gratitude and thanks. Even if, right. even if that it's small nice. things, it doesn't like matter. That. Just do right. it. Well, that's interesting because the first book you mentioned that I wrote was about um, reading the encyclopedia. So a lot of it was about, you know, what does knowledge bring us? And does it bring us wisdom? Does it bring us happiness? What is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? I actually, there is a quote I like. Um, knowledge is knowing that fruit, uh, tomato is a fruit and wisdom is knowing that it doesn't belong in a fruit salad. Mm. Uh, that tomato which I actually disagree. I think that's very restrictive of fruit salad. Why can't a tomato be in a fruit salad? So I, I take it back. But the point is, you know, there is a difference between knowledge and wisdom. And, uh, and for instance, like, I, you know, I ingested thousands of facts. And, it, and individually, a lot of them are completely useless. Like, opossums have 13 nipples. That's still in my brain. I don't need to know that. But, and I just put it in your listener's brain, so I hope it stays there. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, hope, I hope it doesn't. I apologize for putting it in there. But, um, uh, but you know, what, what, was, what were the big takeaways of that experience of ingesting all those facts? And there were many. But one was 
well, relates right back to what we were talking about, gratitude. Because you read about all of human history and you see the good old days, they were not good. They were terrible. They were dangerous, violent, sexist, homophobic, smelly. You can't believe how smelly the world was. You know, it was just, uh, it was just horrible. Um, so we have tremendous problems now, and I don't want to downplay that. And I want to keep trying to solve uh, these puzzles. But, uh, but I also don't want to have this false nostalgia for a, a better past. And there's actually a mantra that I started to use. This is another way to, another one of my many strategies to battle depressionism. If I start to get annoyed about something like, you know, the Wi-Fi is not working, I try to say, remember the three words, um, surgery before anesthesia, because mm -hmm. that was a section in the encyclopedia about what it was like to have surgery before anesthesia was available. And I, I won't get into details because, I mean, it kept me up at nights with the details. But the basic idea is not good. <laughs> it was not pleasant to have surgery without anesthesia. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that is something I'll never have to face, hopefully. And uh, and I'm so grateful for that. Let's just say it was hell for that uh, and leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, I that's think that's a very people. good description of it. Uh, I mean, you can Google it. There are first-person accounts of of it uh, that you can find on the Internet and um, if you really want to. Uh, and maybe it's good. Maybe you'll be more grateful when you read it in detail, but uh, I don't want to assume. So uh, you can find that out on your own. And, I mean, you actually reading the entire encyclopedia and looking at all these facts to build, I guess, a sense of knowledge – uh, it would make you a very, very interesting person, especially like with me, I, I'm a vor voracious reader. Like I love interesting facts. I love books. I love stories. So I'm always rattling off these weird things to my girlfriend. And I think I bore her half to death sometimes. With <laughs> well, that's it. It's, it is a, it's a tricky balance. It is a tricky balance because yeah, I mean, I was ingesting so many facts and I, I just wanted to share them, uh, but maybe I overshared. So uh, my wife started to penalize me. She would charge me one dollar for every irrelevant fact I inserted into conversation. So, you know, she would say, oh, I have a headache. And I would say, oh, did you know the Bayer Aspirin Company invented heroin? And it was originally as a cough suppressant. She's like... Give me a dollar. <laughs> so she made a lot of money. Uh, so you got, you got to balance it. You got to, I, I feel it's a lot about compassion, like looking from the other person's point of view. What would this actually be interesting to them? Or is it I'm just showing off? Yeah. No one likes a know it all, as they say. Just, <laughs> exactly. And no one is a know it all. That's the yeah. other thing I learned. You know, there is so much information out there. And I, I think that the, the, the smartest and wisest people I know are the ones who are so aware of the limits of their intelligence and wisdom, uh, this idea of epistemic humility. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a know-it-all, someone who actually believes they know it all is actually not probably that smart in some ways. No. Then not humble, which you need. But, um, yeah. Anyway, AJ, I know I've got to let you run. I've got to run myself as well. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. My final question for you, this is my all-time favorite question. You probably would have heard it with Dan Cook. I do. I, I know what's so. coming. Okay, Matt. Cool. <laughs> so bear with me on this. Uh, but imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your right. friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done, I can imagine already that it's going to be one hell of an interesting film <laughs> at that. Uh, just imagine they got it all and they put it together in a film for you. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. I, I gave it some thought. I mean, first of all, I would say I would want to make sure the film was interesting to them as well as me because yeah. they're going to be watching it and I'm a hundred. I've lived a long time. I don't want to, you know, so, so that should be their first consideration. Don't do it for me. Do it for the crowd. Second, um, 
I think I would like them to show my failures as well as my successes. Uh, and we talked our first question about how often those are intertwined. It's not always black and white. But I just do want to stress to any descendants I have that, you know, life is not a straight line. And we all struggle. We all have failures. We all have successes. So, and, you know, even I'm sure there'll be videos when everyone's videotaping everything, uh, you know, there'll be videos of me falling on my face. So throw in a couple of those YouTube moments of me, like just face planting. Um, but I'd also love it if there were some of my, my sort of takeaways of things I've learned from an experimental life. Uh, and many of which we've talked about, uh, be curious, not furious. Um, uh, act your way into a new way of thinking. Uh, and, and so sort of a collection of wisdom. Uh, and I do think uh, that sometimes those short phrases can be very powerful. They're just, uh, they're good to remind when I start to get angry. I'm like, all right, let me take a step back and let's get curious instead of furious. So that would be uh, my suggestion. And, and I would say keep it to like 25 minutes. No one needs no one needs longer than that for the, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they want it longer. If it's, uh, if they want it longer and it's comfortable seats, then go as long as you want. So I take that back. Go as long as you want. But, uh, but yes, make it as entertaining and educational for the other people as possible. Well, AJ, this has been a very rewarding and rich in knowledge and, and, and wisdom that people can use in their own life. Thank you so much for your time today, your wisdom, your advice, and your stories, and for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Well, I, I am honored to be here. Thank you for having me, Jay. Just a delight.